Okay. Hello, everyone out there in Facebook world. My name is Kip Walton. I'm a park ranger at Indiana Dunes National Park, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about Indiana Dunes National Park, giving you a little bit of a virtual tour of the park today. So I've got a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, we're going to go through that. And at the end, if there's any questions, um, I'll take questions at the end. Okay, so here we go. So Indiana Dunes National Park, um, Dunes is in the name, obviously, because we have these beautiful dunes along the southern shores of Lake Michigan where we sit. Um, Indiana Dunes National Park, again, sits on those the southern shores of Lake Michigan. So we get the, the flora and the fauna from the north, south, east, and west converging right there. So diversity is a really big key part of our park. It makes um, for beautiful landscapes um, throughout the geology of the park and the the uh, uh, glaciers and, and things that, that occurred 14, 15,000 years ago. And today we have these, um, the, the, the um, effects of that, we have these beautiful landscapes with the dunes. We've got lots of different habitats and the diversity is, is very unique. So we have people from around the world that come and do studies here, professors and scientists that do studies about the plants and the animals um, here in, in the dunes. So the park stretches from Gary, Indiana in the west, um, about 23 miles east to Michigan City, Indiana. And in that stretch there, uh, that 23 mile stretch there, um, again, the park is, is so special because we are juxtaposed with industry, towns and cities and things like that. But yet and still we have these little pockets, these little gems of, of nature and beauty um, that we've taken advantage of. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit today as we go through um, the park. We're going to start on the, the west end of the park and work our way east. So to start out, if it wasn't for people um, like Senator Paul Douglas, um, which the Paul H. Douglas Center is named for, um, which we'll talk about in just a minute, the park wouldn't be here because industry got a big foothold here um, and towns and cities came um, in the area and the area was starting to get depleted but people saw how beautiful it was, and how important it was to keep that, those ecosystems going. So Senator Douglas and many others came together and actually created the park in 1966. So the Paul H. Douglas Center for Environmental Education is kind of nestled in the woods um, in what we call Miller Woods. It's a very unique, very beautiful place. And if you come to visit, there's lots of different things that you can do at the Paul H. Douglas Center. We have an auditorium where obviously um, you can see our park film. Um, we have presentations um, and things like that that you can do. On the weekends, we like to have open houses and sometimes we have special guest speakers that come in um, with their displays and their topics. Even people from um, the Field Museum from Chicago come and they talk about different, different things. We also have a arts and crafts room. And so you're free to come in and with your family and do arts and crafts, nature arts and crafts um, in our arts and crafts room. Right next to that is our animal room. And in the animal room, we have a variety of live animals um, and where the park ranger can talk to you about um, the different animals that live in the dunes and how they adapt to their environment. And um, you might even have a chance to feed the animals um, with the ranger. And some of the animals are turtles and snakes. Um, we have fish, all the animals that are indigenous to uh, the area and to Miller Woods. One of the really special places that we have there um, at the Douglas Center is we have a nature play zone. And it's one of the newest uh, areas of the park that we have. And um, it's kind of special, not too many National parks have nature play zones, so we're very proud of it. And it's one of the things that we realized um, quite early that um, immersing kids in nature, they tend to learn a little bit better. Um, a lot of kids need that hands-on, they need to get physical and be out and touch nature. And so this helps them get out in nature. We've cordoned off an area <clears throat> near the parking lot where families can come and they can have the kids um, build forts, uh, work together, communication skills are, are 
uh, used to work together to build forts and, and things like that. And they even get to climb trees. I mean, that's kind of important. Some of the kids in the area, uh, they come from Chicago and other surrounding cities and they don't get the chance to do things like that. So um, getting them out in the park and letting them know that nature is a very fun place to learn um, and get them in touch with, with nature is important. So let's talk about Miller Woods itself. Um, Miller Woods is an actual oak savanna ecosystem. And um, it, this area, this region, we don't have um, a lot of areas that represent um, oak savanna ecosystems. They're very rare. And so Miller Woods is one of those places that uh, um, it showcases an oak savanna ecosystem and it does it quite well. You're gonna let, get to see lots of flora and fauna, deer and other animals. And like I said, the animals in the animal room um, those are some of the animals that you can possibly see uh, when you're hiking through Miller Woods. Miller Woods Oak Savanna ecosystem is unique. Um, you've got lots of dune and swale. And in, those, in that swale area, you've got these wetlands. And um, very beautiful and creates its own habitat for um, aquatic plants, microinvertebrates, fish, things like that. It's even a great area um, for waterfowl. In fact, uh, migrating waterfowl come through and they find um, the Miller Woods um, swales and the interdunal ponds there, very important for their migration. Little resting areas, places that they can stop and feed and rest on their migration. And this is the wetland area here in Miller Woods. You can see that tree in the middle of the wetland there. It's been chewed on a little bit. These kids are standing on top of a mound that was created by beavers. So these trees are chewed down. Beavers are very active in, in the Miller Woods ecosystem in this area. And little, the kid is actually pointing on top of the dune there. You can see where the beaver have, they climb up there to the side of the dune, they chew the tree down and then, uh, then they slide the tree down into the water and float it over to their lodge to build their lodge. Got a very high beaver population. In fact, what we're doing now is we're putting up trail cams and we're actually trying to um, uh, take pictures and, and video of the beaver um, doing their active work. It's really neat to be able to come to a place where you can actually get up close and personal and see where uh, the beaver have actually chewed the trees and how they do it. It's amazing to me yeah, every time I see it, um, seeing that a rodent can actually chew down a whole tree. Pretty neat. So the Miller Woods ecosystem is maintained by fire. And, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, this area was, you know, there'd be periodic fires that went through and uh, maintained it. Um, now we have to actually start the fires. So we go through our fire team, um, which is part of our resource management division. They go through and they do prescribed burns. So they'll section off an area and they'll burn it um, so that it maintains that ecosystem. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people, they see this and they're like, oh, those, you know, the park rangers, they're, they're burning down the woods again. What they don't understand is what's happening here is, is not only is it getting rid of invasive species that don't belong, but it's putting nutrients back into the soil. So it looks like this after a burn it looks kind of devastated, <clears throat> like a moonscape almost. It looks like it's been destroyed. But give it a few months, give it a month or so, and this is what happens. You get beautiful wildflowers that start to grow back from those ashes. And it actually helps maintain the flora and the fauna. So really, Miller Woods is one of my favorite spots. And it doesn't matter what time of year you go, you're gonna have fun. You're gonna see some interesting things. It's extremely beautiful. Um, ecosystem when you walk through it. So I encourage everyone to come out um, to the Paul H. Douglas Center, hike Miller Woods, um, enjoy uh, the Miller Woods ecosystem. Now from there, we're gonna head west, or excuse me, we're gonna head east to West Beach. And it's just a few miles um, east of, of Miller Woods and the Paul H. Douglas Center. Um, but it, again, it's, this is another um, totally different type of ecosystem, very striking and very beautiful. Um, and again, glaciers um, are what helped carve 
um, and create this ecosystem that we're going to see. As you come into West Beach, it's one of the places that you do have to, to pay to get in. Um, Six dollars typically for um, the average person coming in in a motorized vehicle, and that's for parking. Once you come in, there'll be a park ranger there uh, that will give you a brochure about the area and answer any other questions that you might have on the park itself. And then you're off to explore this beautiful place. It's one of the places that we do have a bathhouse and the amenities at the bathhouse are very nice. Um, we do have showers and restrooms. Um, we have a concession. Um, and sometimes there's in the summertime, we have food trucks there. Um, so plenty of food to eat, uh, plenty of places to, to get yourself prepared to get out on the beach and, and recreate. And uh, a lot of people come out. I mean, we get over 2 million visitors a year. And uh, those 2 million visitors, uh, probably more than half of them end up on the beach, right? And so they don't actually get to see uh, the rest of the park or even the rest of West Beach. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that today. Getting out to West Beach, there's trails to hike. It's a great place where kids and families can come and learn about the dunes and about what created this ecosystem with the glaciers and the Lake Michigan itself. It's a really dynamic, beautiful place to go, um, place to have fun, some place where you can't actually um, hike through the dunes themselves. Now these dunes just don't um, just form there. Um, they, they do form there, but they just, they're not, um, how do I say it? They're maintained and stabilized by plants. So these views that you see, um, it's important that you stay on the trails because otherwise the dunes will blow away if the, the what we call the primary dune stabilizers weren't there. And so what you're looking at here is on top of one of the dunes looking over the bathhouse, Lake Michigan, and you can see um, Chicago in the far distance. Now, without primary dune stabilizers, those dunes wouldn't be there and you wouldn't have those beautiful views. Marum grass is one of the main plants that uh, is a primary dune stabilizer. It's a beautiful grass that um, has adapted itself uh, to the dunes. It stabilizes the, the sand there um, and helps keep the dune shape. Another primary dune stabilizer, cottonwood tree. And these cottonwood trees are very beautiful. Um, they have these thick waxy leaves. One of the adaptations that they have for surviving on the dunes is the fact that they have the thick waxy leaves. They almost feel fake when you touch them. And that's to stop transpiration. The tree doesn't want to lose a lot of moisture because it's almost like a desert-like situation that it's in, especially in the summertime. So it kind of keeps that moisture in. Um, it doesn't uh, lose the, the water through evaporation and the nutrients through evaporation. Another thing that it can do is if the roots are exposed, the roots can actually over time turn into branches and leaves can grow off and vice versa. If branches are covered by sand, shifting sands, <clears throat> those branches can uh, point downwards and grab a hold of the sand and become roots. So it's, uh, it's very, very good at this um, unstable ecosystem. Another plant that's a dune stabilizer and, and also nourishes some of the animals that live there is um, the sand cherry. And those sand cherries are edible and they also help stabilize the dune as well. In this area, we've got beautiful wildflowers that grow, such as the cocoons and uh, other uh, lupin and other uh, wildflowers. We have grapes, river grapes, wild river grapes that grow, a good another food source for lots of animals um, that live there in West, at West Beach and in the dunes there. We have prickly pear cactus, and right alongside prickly pear cactus, we have Arctic bearberry. So we've got an Arctic plant and a desert plant growing right there together. Um, so very, very unique, very diverse. Um, one plant that you do have to watch out for is poison ivy. Unfortunately, there is a lot of poison ivy there. So keep your eye out um, for the poison ivy as you're hiking the trails. Um, it likes to poke its head up through the, the boardwalk in some places. Um, so be careful as you're going down the boardwalk. Usually if there's a plant um, going, growing up through the stairs of the boardwalk, um, it's usually poison ivy, so you have to be careful about that. So 
some of the fauna that uh, you'll find, <clears throat> this happens to be a Fowler's toad. And it's amongst the Arctic uh, bearberry. And uh, it's one of those animals that can camouflage itself and bury itself down in the sand and feel very comfortable there. And uh, so it, it lives in the dunes eating the insects and things. But unfortunate for it, there is an animal that hunts it as well. You can see by the tracks here, you probably can guess this is a snake. The snake that likes to hunt it is called a hog nose snake. And you can see the turned up nose there. And of course, in the front of the face there to have that turned up face, that nose, hog nose, um, it's an adaptation for it to actually dig down into the, into the soil, <clears throat> the sand, and to catch those toads. So that's what it's doing. It digs down, catches those toads. And then you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little inside the mouth, there's these little, um, oh, I don't even want to call them fangs. They're just, um, they're little spikes that come out and they actually, when they're trying to eat that toad, they puncture that toad. The toad loses the air because the toad doesn't want to get eaten, right? So it swells itself up. Well, it gets punctured and the hognose snake is able to swallow it down. Now the hognose snake itself um, is prey for other animals, right? Um, like raccoons and hawks and things like that. And if it doesn't want to get eaten, especially if a person walks up on it, doesn't know whether it's, you know, friend or foe, it's going to display like a cobra and spread its hood out like that, its neck out like a hood, and it might even strike and hiss. Uh, rarely does it bite, and it's not poisonous. So if it does bite, it's not going to cause you any harm, um, but it's a display. And if that doesn't work, <clears throat> then it turns over on its belly and plays dead. And it secretes a, a really foul smelling odor, a musk. Um, it smells like dead decay. And most animals don't eat dead things, right? So most animals, after they see that and smell that, they walk away and the snake gets to take off. Another really neat critter that uh, you can find in the dunes <clears throat> is a six line race runner. And the six line race runner is really neat. Um, it catches the insects. A lot of people don't see it, but they'll hear it. As they're walking across um, the dunes or along the trails, they'll hear something scurrying. Well, that's that six line race runner um, getting out of the way of your footsteps. And uh, one of the really unique things about the six line race runner is if um, a predator does grab onto it, it's usually the back end of it because it's so fast, it only can catch the back end of it. And it can actually drop its tail, drops the tail off, and the predator ends up eating the tail. Um, and the lizard takes off and escapes. And over time, the tail grows back. So. so now we're gonna move further east and we're gonna go to the Chilbrook Farm, Bailey Homestead, a little bit of a history uh, in the park. And um, the Chilbergs were from Sweden. And when they came in the turn of the century, um, they came to this area. There were other people in the area, not very many, but there were a few in, in the area. And they started first by chopping down the trees that were in the area. So they, they did a little lumbering at first when they were here, um, selling the lumber um, and then clearing the land because they were farmers when they were in Sweden. So they ended up uh, getting ready to, to start farming the land, um, doing their crops and having their animals. You can see here the barn where they would have had uh, cows, pigs, chickens, goats, um, things like that um, on, on the farm. These are pictures of some of the um, buildings, the outbuildings that they would have had uh, where they stored their supplies. Corn crib that you see here. Uh, they had a, a, a pump house where they would, a windmill would pump the, the water for them. Um, that's how they got their water. This happens to be the chicken coop they would have kept their chickens. And uh, of course they had the farmhouse itself where they would have made their meals. And even today we have um, special events and programs that we do. Um, in these special events, we have volunteers come in and they actually cook on the wood burning stove, just like the Chelbergs would have. And they make delicious meals um, to show place, to show uh, showcase when visitors come through. 
This happens to be the sugar shack that the Chelbergs would have had where they make maple sugar. And that's one of the programs that, that we have as, as well as uh, uh, we talk about harvesting and, and uh, show off the horses and just the way of life that the Chelbergs would have had um, when they were, were here. Now, the maple sugar program is our biggest event. We um, actually uh, tap the trees around, the maple trees around uh, the Chilburg farm, and we um, cook that down in the sugar shack and make our own maple syrup. It's delicious stuff. It's pretty amazing. Again, some of these festivals that we have um, showcase the different things that uh, the Chilburgs and the life of farmers and homesteaders around that area, making their own clothing, um, having the animals do the work for them, things that we don't think about today that they would have had to do back in the, in the turn of the century. Um, the horse was, was their most important tool, so they had to take care of the, the horses and, and learn good horsemanship back then. So that's the Chelberg Farm and Bailey Homestead area that you can visit. Now we're gonna go into the Michigan City area um, to the far east end of the park and visit Mount Baldy. This is one of our tallest dunes, over 100 feet, feet tall. Um, we've got the marim grass, as you can see here, stabilizing that dune. It's one of the most popular places that people want to go visit. It's really neat because it's one of those places um, that people climb to the top of the dune and they can overlook Lake Michigan. And when you're up there, it seems like you feel like you're in a whole different world. You don't feel like you're in Northwest Indiana at all. You're looking at that uh, emerald green water and uh, you could be off the coast of the Mediterranean or, or you could be in Africa somewhere off the coast of Africa. It's just, it's amazing. It's a beautiful place. Now the dunes, as they, as they grow, um, they cover the forest and those trees, um, the oak trees and things like that, they're not able to survive. So they sometimes die. So a lot of times you'll see ghost forests in that area. As you can see here, um, these guys are up here and they're trying to stabilize this dune. They're, they're blocking it off so that the dune doesn't, um, doesn't blow over onto the forest anymore. That's one of the problems that we're having is keeping that dune stabilized. So our staff, they go in, our resource management division and fire team, they go in and they try to fence that off so that people aren't killing the vegetation um, at the very top of the dune and uh, so that the dune doesn't blow off um, as, it, as it was in the past. So now we're gonna go to Pinhook Bog, which is another really, really um, interesting, unique ecosystem. Um, it's a bog, it's where you've got the substrate, the ground is actually clay underneath. And 14, 15,000 years ago during the Wisconsin glacial era, um, like I said before, the whole area was, was basically manufactured by glaciers. You had these um, uh, glacial erratics, these big, huge boulders and big, huge chunks of ice gouging out the land. And as that happened and the ice melted, these um, big bodies of water were left. And over time, um, they got covered by moss sediment and moss. And what we got from that was a bog because there was no fresh water that could get in other than um, runoff because the clay substrate um, underneath kept water from flowing in. So with that, we've got unique plants such as the pitcher plant that you see here that eats insects. And no other place are you gonna find that other than bogs that are in the area. This is a sundew, another insect eating plant. Um, they have unique ways of catching insects. So the pitcher plant, if an insect falls inside, it has a hard time getting out and falls back down and drowns inside the pitcher plant. And the pitcher plant um, is able to, to digest it. The sundew that you see here, reason why they call it a sundew is because when the sun shines on it, those little droplets that look like little water droplets um, are actually just um, secreted from the plant. It's a sticky substance. So if you're a a fly, a little gnat or something like that, and you land on it thinking that it's water droplets, it's not, and you get stuck on there. And as you struggle, it triggers the plant to close on you and then, then you get digested. So, 
when you're walking through the bog, um, you have to go with a park ranger because it's such a fragile ecosystem. And once you're in there with that park ranger, you're going to stay on the boardwalk. And it's a floating mat of sphagnum moss that you're going to be on. Underneath you um, is water. Um, and so you want to stay on that that bog. And even though you're on that bog I or on that mat um, of sphagnum moss and on top of the boardwalk, it behoove you to wear uh, old shoes because um, that bog water does seep up through um, the boardwalk sometimes. So it's important. Now, talk about some of the recreational things that you can do in the park because we talked about a lot of the, the sites of the park, um, but our park is also a place where people lo love to come and recreate. So some of the things that you can do, some of the favorite things that I like to do in the park is go boating, kayaking. Um, it's one of my favorite things. Um, fishing from kayaks or canoes is one of my favorite things too. Lots of uh, largemouth bass and other fish, salmon and other things that you can catch in the stream. As long as you have a um, valid fishing, Indiana fishing license, you're allowed to, to fish in our waters. Birding is another favorite thing um, that people love to do, especially in the fall and in the spring during the migrations. Um, getting out into uh, the different trails of the park to do birding is really, really important and really fun to do. In the winter time, there's cross. Excuse me. In the winter time, there's cross country skiing, which is really neat as well. You can do that. Snowshoeing is also something that you can do at the Paul H. Douglas Center for Environmental Education. We have uh, cross cross country skis and snowshoes um, that you can come and, and borrow. It's no charge. Um, you just have to use it on our trails there. And just getting out with the family and hiking through the dunes and seeing this beautiful landscape is uh, is really, really fun to do. So I encourage everybody to come out, explore our park, our beaches, and just have a great time at Indiana Dunes. <laughs>